brief bit of background. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. By, um, by training. Uh, I've been, uh, as Chris said, I've been involved in photography for quite a long time, uh, more than 20 years. I, I started because of uh, research, like any person in university, it's probably where you start with these things, and I needed it as a tool. I wasn't doing it because I wanted to know about thermography, but I needed it as a tool, just as you're going to be using it as a tool. Uh, but I, this first system I got cost, um, about 20 years ago, cost a quarter of a million dollars then. So that's a lot of money in those days, it's still a lot of money today, but you can imagine, you know, try and translate it to today's terms, probably 400,000 or something. Um, and uh, so the, no one was going to let me loose just spending that without having to justify it, so I had to get into really understand technology as well. So one of the advantages for me is I've become quite conversant with the actual technology, but we're not going to tell you a lot about what goes on inside the cameras unless you ask the questions. Um, as again Chris said, I do a lot of training and it's done through the University of Melbourne but through what's called the Infrared Training Centre, which is an international body based um, in both the US and in Sweden as their headquarters and they are a training arm of FLIR. However, they try to operate as distinctly as they can. So when I've been to both the US for some training and been to um, trainers meetings and um, users uh, group meetings in Sweden, uh, when you go to the FLIR office, you find that they have a physical demarcation between where the the ITC, the training arm, is done, and then where they're producing the cameras. And in fact, in the, uh, in, in the case of uh, the US, you actually enter by different doors, and you have to have a special pass to get from one part to the other. So they try to keep them separate, but obviously there's always going to be some bias towards the products. So I've been doing that for a while, but before that, um, someone was mentioning Eric Thorup before. Um, he and I and uh, two others developed the first courses which were ever to uh, offered in Australia. We actually developed them and ran them for a number of years before getting involved with the ITC, so we're running this international course now. I'm also involved with the Australian Professional Thermography Association, uh, so that's just by way of background, me and thermography. So, thermography, what can we use it for? Well, some of the things that you will have seen other than buildings would have been, most of you would be aware of the use of it in Hotspot on the television. Hotspot does not use a camera like this, but it's still using an infrared camera. It's just using one which is uh, probably in today's terms about $110,000. So, considerably more expensive than your camera, uh, but it's using this, basically the same technology, the same idea. They just need to, because they're looking from a longer distance and trying to pick up a very quick uh, heat signature. Uh, your camera will be probably operating at about nine hertz. So it's taking an image uh, nine times a second, the update. Um, those ones for the hotspot will, will be working in at least 100 hertz. Mm. With that uh, hotspot that's being shown on the bat at the moment, yep. what sort of a temperature differential are we talking about? Uh, well, I don't know for certain, but knowing those types of cameras, you could get that sort of quality with looking at probably about a degree and a half. It doesn't need to be very large at all to get a very clear witness with those cameras. And again, it's one of the reasons we're going to those cameras rather than um, using something like this. But also, of course, because this one's filled with you, you're way back to the boundary, you wouldn't see anything, so they've got special lens as well. Um, but yeah, that does pick up quite a small uh, temperature change. And how long would that last for? Uh, that normally will only last for perhaps um, somewhere between half a second and a second. That's so again why they need so many yeah. frames. So it always looks like it's there a long time, but that's because they've got enough frames to be able to slow it up and yeah. show it there. They're unlikely to miss it if it actually occurs. Uh, and it's visible to you. I and mean, one of the things, of course, is that if it's um, if it actually sort of caught on the side of the back or somewhere where you're just not in line of sight, you're not going to see it. Infrared cameras cannot see through stuff in general. There are some exceptions, but generally things like a bat, they won't see through. Um, other 
sort of common use or becoming more common anyway is night vision in cars. Um, the, um, the, the more expensive um, BMWs, Cadillacs, um, are two brands I'm aware of which have this as um, basically built into them. As the cost of the detectors come down, it's likely that more and more cars, and eventually I suspect all cars will have it. Um, we're talking just now about the cost of the detectors, uh, well, the camera's coming down, and this complete camera there is $1,000, and that's to purchase. They're making that for, uh, I'm guessing, probably $250. So if you buy in bulk for the cars, you can be putting them down in for, you know, just almost peanuts for them in terms of the cost of the car. Um, so I can see them being on cars very soon as a, as a standard thing. Mm. Uh, and it, of it, the main problem is you don't spend all your time looking at it. That's the danger of, with any of these aids in the car, of course. Um, that goes beyond thermography, but it comes to the, the human usability. Mm. And um, one of the ideas is can we have it projected up so it's a straight ahead and it doesn't get in the way and all this. But the point here is they're showing that if you look very carefully, you can just about make out someone down there, whereas they stand out extremely well there. So this is where but not really picking up other cars. I know who you're hitting. You know who you're hitting. <laughs> well, there's two people there, so if you just swerve to the left, you get the other one. That was right. Yep. Or if you really do a good job, you'll get both. You're seeing one slightly further ahead than the other. A bit of bowling technology. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm just trying to point out that you know, it's beyond what we're looking at for these cameras, but they're sort of special applications, but that's where it's going. Um, and essentially, they're looking at looking to develop more markets, uh, more in the way of consumer type goods is uh, what the companies are looking for. Now, as mentioned before, we'll look, we'll, I'll briefly touch on these other applications. And we're only going to briefly touch on them just to give you a feel for what it can do because we really want to concentrate on this building side of things. But one of them is monitoring of medical conditions, um, not necessarily looking for blue baby syndrome, um, that's just the false colours. Uh, but um, and it's been used in that area from about the mid-60s. However, it still is not widely accepted um, for a lot of stuff in the medical area, um, mainly because of the conservatism of the medical profession. There's nothing wrong with the technology, it's just them. Um, but we will argue about that some other time. Um, one that we're talking about here is being able to locate dampness. And we have here some damp spots, or apparently damp spots. We'll talk a bit about all the paper on this uh, floor here, which would be completely invisible to the naked eye. Um, you'd pick it up with a moisture meter, but you'd have to know where to look. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with infrared, basically you'll see that, you'll say, that looks suspicious, whip out the moisture meter, and then you can test to see whether it really is or not. Yes, sir? Is it guaranteed to be a temperature difference? I mean, we're looking, we're measuring temperature differences with these cameras, so what we're saying is that there's pretty much a guaranteed temperature difference um, yeah, but that's still temperature difference. Yeah, so I'm sorry, that's what it's based on. Yeah, it's based but, but that's for this. That's for the dampness here. Mm. When we are looking at a uniform material, as in this case the carpet or the floor, where we see differences in colour like this, they are representing temperature differences. The cameras themselves are not picking up temperature. They pick up thermal radiation and it is ah. what we will get is off different surfaces even at the same temperature they will emit a different amount of radiation so you will get what is technically termed the apparent temperature you'll get an apparent temperature difference even when there may not be one However, I'm looking at a uniform surface like the floor here, then I am sure that that is a temperature difference. Now, it then becomes the question of why is it different? Has someone just gone and put some cold thermal blocks underneath the carpet there, and there's no dampness at all? Or is it really dampness, or is it something else? These are other questions. And, but, and that's why I said, when you see that, you whip out your moisture meter and confirm. Mm. So this is where, why we have week-long courses to try and explain all this um, in, in more detail. And particularly if you want to get numbers for measurement. A 
lot of building applications, but not all, tend to work on qualitative. It's hotter or colder, not how much. Mm. Identifying. It's identifying the situation, not how much. Now, it's not that you don't want to know numbers sometimes, and in particular, if you're trying to uh, determine the insulation rating of um, walls or surfaces, um, then you actually do need to know numbers. If you are trying to determine the amount of uh, energy loss from buildings, if you're doing an energy audit, rather than just saying, well, we've got a leak somewhere, but if you do an audit, you will need numbers. And then it becomes important. And that's really a further step. Um, we'll, we'll possibly show that later when we get to do the demonstration. What's the scale of the bottom? Is that that's temperature scale. Um, and so that's going from 16 degrees up to 21 degrees Celsius. Um, some of my images will be uh, pinched from the US and they may have Fahrenheit in there too. But um, these cameras you can um, set whichever you wish. So anybody who still prefers Fahrenheit, you can have your camera set in that. And um, if you go and change it to Fahrenheit, leave it like that just to confuse the next people who <laughs> pick it up and then look at somebody and wonder why they're appearing to be 90 degrees. Well, they should be because it's mm. Fahrenheit correct, but you might not expect it. So. One of the problems with multiple people using these cameras is that you can change the settings and people aren't always quite aware of what it is and wonder why they're getting a strange result. And uh, again, I may talk a little bit about that later in the Q&A. Um, so it's just a couple of other applications I could go through a, a huge range. Condition monitoring is the main one. Yeah, we use it for electrical. So electrical is, is the number one use still has been that way since it became a commercial technology. Um, so since the early 60s, electrical has been the main one and continues to be the main one. But there's a lot of mechanical applications mm. as well, uh, in particular looking at the hot yeah. bearings for uh, lack of balance uh, in, in things like couplings, uh, but also um, if you're looking at um, belt drives, actually see whether you're over or under tightened on the belt drives. So there's a number of applications still within the mechanical area as well as things like furnaces and looking at the degradation of the, uh, of, of the uh, bricks to mm. the insulation on them. Well, every year we get at least 10 to 15 faults when we go over the plant that you would never see by eye no. at all. So it's, been, it's very valuable when you get on big, larger equipment. Equipment, that's right. So that's the main area still, but that's not what I was asked for for this brief here, but I'm more than happy to get into that. Like, you know, watching because I'll be going all night um, quite easily. So what is this infrared thermography? So by definition, it's the use of the cameras to image and analyse thermal energy emitted from an object. So notice about thermal energy, not about temperatures. That's important to understand. And so what we see here is a case of where we've actually got poor um, ceiling under the wall here. And so we've then got air leakage here, which is showing up clearly in the thermal image, but doesn't show up in the visible. The other thing you'll note here is that you can clearly see the studs in the wall. Now it's not because we can see through the wall. That's not where we've mm -hmm. seen the studs. They're just cool. It's because when you've got the studs, they actually act as a thermal bridge, and so you've got more contact than where in between, where you've usually got insulation. So you're going to get a different picture, and you'll get a different picture there. It can look, in this case, like it's um, cooler, where that would normally indicate that the room behind or the outside is cooler than the inside, but you can actually get it the other way around as well. So in Australia, where we often do the thermography in buildings in summer, you will actually see these looking hot and the in-betweens looking cooler. And so that's a game where you've got to get your head around it. You get a reversed image of what you're used to seeing. And um, it really is one of the traps of going to some of the overseas courses because they tend to only look at cold weather surveys. So it's a matter of that interpretation. So Alan, would, would that be showing that the, there's like a gap at the bottom of the mm. wall there that, you know, it looks very yeah, well, dark. Well, that's right. I mean, this is meant to be sealed. It, it looks in the visible here like it might be an obvious gap, but in fact, 
what you've actually got is a larger gap in these spots here where it's actually gaps leaking in the air. Or something, Cold yeah. air is coming in. It's a doorway or something. No, it's actually a wall. It's like an architrave on the, on the so skirting board. Skirting board on the wall, and it's obviously got gaps yeah. around so it. Behind it. Well no mm. And so you've got some, and, and this is a fairly typical sort of pattern that you get when you've got the air leakage. Um, so again, it's a partly a matter of experience, much as anything else. This is what we typically see, and so you start to say, well, that's what I've got there. But again, if it was hot outside and cold inside, I wouldn't be seeing this coming in as a dark colour. This would be hotter, mm. so it would be brighter oh. than the other. So you'll actually get the reverse. But you must have it flowing. So unless you're on a day when you've got the wind blowing in the right direction, oh, okay. you're not going to see that. No, you've got to have the flow. Or you've got the AC set up in such a way that it's actually uh, evacuating the air, not pumping it in. Mm. Pulling. So you're pulling then you'll see that. Is it a power point that's uh, glowing in the... That's a power point. Yep. Okay. So that's a, a, a hole in your thermal insulation, is it? Or well, is that's it probably because it's actually Nothing got some plug. current running through there. Nothing, doesn't look to be in plug Doesn't either. matter. Some of these plugs will always have um, some heating going on. And not all of them, but a lot of, especially uh, overseas, it's quite common. Um, in fact, they have an indicator light there as well. Mm. And um, that's just always on. Okay. Always drawing a small amount. Um, it doesn't always happen with the Australian one, mm -hmm. but it certainly happens with uh, some of the ones from overseas. Um, so, uh, but no, I, I would say that's nothing to do with the um, what's going on behind. That is straight electrical heating. Because mm. it is a hot spot. Isn't it, it is hot. So that's not wrong. Warm. Well, it's warm, but it's hot. Mm -hmm. but, but a matter of interpretation. Is it because we've got a leakage there, or something else? In this case, I'm fairly sure it's not a leakage because we know. But what's behind is coal. Mm. So if that's letting a leak, I'd expect it to be darker around that. Mm. Not bright. Might be a poor connection out of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'm not saying you shouldn't investigate in particular if, unless you know about them. This is where mm. you need to have knowledge of what you're looking at. Mm. It's not just a matter of being an expert in demography, you've actually got to be also an expert yeah. in yeah. what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where uh, the trap is, because we can see anything we like with it. You know, we were saying before about you can clip onto an iPhone, and anybody can do that these days, and they get but about, what, $250, for those ones that clip onto a smartphone. And so everybody can become a thermographer, but we don't even know what they're looking at. This is where the danger applies. We're in people's top noses. Usually cold. Well, it's about, it's about the best thing, it's looking at pets and things like that, and just having fun images. Mm. As long as people stay with that, that's fine. Um, but, <laughs> I know that when they first, when Fleur first brought out the um, their Fleur One, which is the one that clips onto the iPhone 5, um, the manager of Fleur in Australia at the time got a phone call, I think from someone from the US, who actually said, <coughs> how do I get reports out of my phone? Oh, I'm going to use it for commercial purposes. It was never designed for that. This is the danger. Once it comes down in price, everybody can grab one, they all think they're a thermographer. Scary stuff. You're going to find more and more of that going on. So we just look at the temperatures there. So, just to again emphasize what's going on, when we look at things with our eyes, most of the time what we're seeing is in fact a reflection. The only time I'm not looking at a reflection is I'm looking directly at the lights or looking at the sun. Otherwise, it's a reflection. I'm not seeing you, I'm seeing a reflection of you, or off you, not like you. That's what's going on. So the reason this heater here looks sort of greyish is simply because that's the part of the spectrum that the heater surface reflects. When we see it in the infrared, it's different. It's not looking at a reflection of the infrared, it's actually looking at what's been emitted, thrown out by the body itself. This is where it's different. So we've then got to understand that. But now also, besides what's being emitted, there will be some reflection. Because the room itself is warm, and it will partly reflect off that, as well as this thing itself emitting. And one of the compensations in the cameras is for reflections. If you want to get an accurate temperature number, you have to put in an appropriate correction 
for the reflection. And that becomes an issue of how do you get that value, and that's part of what the training in the course is all about. But you'll find that that is a setting in the cameras. And if people have set that at a really strange value in the camera, and that might have been appropriate for their application, they might have been standing somewhere looking at a surface and they've got the sun behind them belting down at the surface and they've put in a high reflected number. When they go around and look at everything else, it's going to be showing up as everything being very cold. And you're saying, this camera's broken. That can't be minus 10 degrees, minus 20 degrees. And you can't be, and you can't be, and you can't be, but the camera keeps saying you all are. I can see you all in the picture, it says everything's minus 20. It's broken. No, you've just got the wrong setting in there. So this is where you've got to be, know a bit more about the cameras. Um, just to make you aware of where it works, obviously we have the visible light and infrared is next to it in the spectrum. And um, the cameras we and the infrared spectrum goes from approximately one micron down to, or up to, depending on which way you want to read it, one millimetre. That's the infrared spectrum. It's actually slightly larger. It's uh, about 0.6 up to that or something, 0.7, but I'm not really fussed about that. But the cameras we have operate in only two regions that we use. And the type that we've got here, and most of them around these days, are this one they call the long wave. So that's all you're going to get. But the really fancy ones, there are some fancy ones out there which operate in the mid-wave. My first camera was a mid-wave camera that caught me in the <laughs> Uh, I think, or well, I could be wrong, that the ones they use for the hotspot might also be a mid um, Well, I'm not 100% sure, so I don't know exactly. Did your camera die? Did that one die? Uh, they have had the, some that die, but most of the issue there was um, there was some arguments about whether or not we could, they would accept the evidence from it. Mm -hmm. There's some debate at one stage. Uh, that's something separate to really the camera. I don't think it's more the camera, it's more... But is issues. that still camera still around though? Is it, yes. It's still yeah. Yeah. And it is used, it's, fine. Okay. it's still used, but it's, I don't think it's been used by the third umpire. Yeah. That's what's changed. Well, I mean your one. Oh, my one? No, my one. one. No, it's not dead. I okay. just can't find all the parts. Oh, the sorry. Yeah. That's my problem. Um, because they tossed me out of the lab and people decided just to help themselves so and they leave things, things and I don't know where it all is now. Mm -hmm. no, it's still work last time I was using it. Um, not that one. Well, a couple of years ago it was still working. Now, even though infrared radiation is close to the visible, it doesn't always behave like visible. Forget about the fact that the camera itself is operating differently to our eyes. It also, the visible and infrared can look quite different. So, this is my reflection in this window. We can just about make it out there. It's actually not the best image because if I actually had a better image, you would actually not see me at all in that, but you would still see me very clearly in the infrared. And in fact, in something like these whiteboards, you probably can't see my reflection and just see my shadow, but not my reflection. Mm -hmm. The infrared will look almost the same as that. Mm -hmm. So it's because I'm reflecting the infrared radiation and that's coming back to it. So it's where you suddenly say, well, there's not much reflection there, it can't be an issue. And suddenly it's surprising how much reflection there is. And so in this case, it's giving false temperatures. This glass on this window is fairly uniform. But it looks like it's got a whole lot of different temperatures on it. So it's really picking it up off you. So what it's doing is picking up my reflections, not how hot the temperature, how hot the window is. This is where you've got to make the compensation. So you, this is where it gets tricky if you want the numbers. Why we've got to be careful how we interpret what we see. We can also work the other way. This is um, a standard sort of garbage bag over my head. Uh, quite often we do this type of thing live, we used to, but then oh and s and got all upset about doing things like that, so I generally don't bring a black, a black plastic bag in anymore. Um, it used to be good when we had Eric to help, because I always put it over his head. Yes, uh, it was always the one we'd pick on. Uh, but this is using my camera here, this camera. Um, that's what you see when looking through that. In this case, we do see through. So this is one thing we are seeing through. Well, 
more the point, we're not actually seeing through, but more the infrared radiation from inside is passing through it to the camera. So some things which are in which you can't see through in the uh, visible, we can get quite a good image there. Not perfect. Um, it does, it does um, reduce it somewhat. Oh, well, you can see that. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm a bit warmer than 30 degrees. Mm. And I'm not going to be 38 degrees, mm. 37 degrees on most of my skin. Most of that's slightly yeah, low, too. especially with beard. Um, but it, but it, you know, it's still expect about 34, 35. So it's reduced it a bit, but not a huge amount, it turns out. Um, well, would, is there any chance that that's just the temperature of the, um, the black plastic? Well, if, if it is, then why is it that it looks like me? Mm. You can see the eyes, the mouth. The, the plastic the would be fairly uniform. And it's mm. not because it's up against me. You can see that I've actually got quite a bit of space between me and the, the bag for most of it. If it's pressed hard up against my face, then that would be a reasonable comment to make because of the low conductivity of the plastic, it would uh, not necessarily diffuse very well. Um, but it's also very thin, so it will actually take on a fairly uniform temperature fairly quickly. What's causing the fairly sharp yellow edge around the, say around the top of your head? Uh, I would have thought that would just gradually fade to the edge. <coughs> yeah, um, it's, a, it's got a couple of causes. The, the main one is that um, the cameras themselves have uh, a number of um, pixels making up the image. And my face is not going to be something which will follow exactly one around one pixel like that. Yeah. It will follow through somewhere like that. So these are going to be only sort of half made up from me and half from the environment. So they're going to be somewhere in between. So you're going to get the sort of average sort of temperature there. You're going to get it colder out here away from my face and then hot up on my actual face. So that's essentially what's going on. Um, it's slightly more complex than that, but it's basically that's what's going on. And you'll see it around a lot of objects that you'll get this, uh, what looks almost like a halo. Uh, and uh, there is there's other stories I can tell about that. Uh, where people have bought it because they thought it would show, actually shows a halo around people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. But so we we can't see visibly through black plastic, but I can see it with the infrared. However, nice glass here. I can see my fingers through it. Infrared. Really, I can't. There seems to be something there, and that's probably more because I was actually pretty touching the edge of the glass but certainly nothing like what we've seen the clarity before. So glass essentially is um, impervious to the infrared that we see. Sorry, these cameras see that long way. If we had a mid-wave camera, it will actually see through that. So it's not as if you put a piece of glass and you knock out all infrared, but in the region which we, these cameras operate in, mm -hmm. it pretty much is 100% attenuation, unless you have extremely thin standard incandescent light globes, you will get some through, but even then, it's a huge drop. Mm. They're um, mm. trying to think what the temperature is on a um, incandescent, the, the, the um, tungsten, um, yeah. I think it's 2,800 degrees. You put on the infrared camera, one of these type, and look at it, and it will show up as about 300. You're actually getting more of the temperature of the glass than you are of the element mm. itself. But if you have the mid wave cameras, like my old camera, you'll actually be able to see that um, element. It's really quite pretty. But it's still even then, it's attenuated. OK, so on to buildings. Where can we use it? Locating moisture. It will not pick up mold, despite the fact that I know certain people who say it will. It will pick up moisture, so it will pick up where you're likely to have mold. Now, if mould's on the external surface, you can see it with your eyes anyway, so why bother having a camera? And if it's hidden behind a cavity or something, then you're not picking up the mould, you're just picking up the fact that it's got moisture there. So if it's regularly there, then the chances are you've got moisture. Then you've got mould. Does the mass of the mould sort of make it give you a bit of well, cold, more water? If, if you have enough mould, but 
that's not unusual. Yeah, you need to have quite a lot of mould, just like quite a bit. A fairly thin layer of mould, then it's not going to be great. If it's that thick, then it's going to start having that influence. You'd have smelled it long ago and done something about it. Um, leaking roofs, and I'll actually have got at the end of this, um, if we've got time, a case study of where I've looked for a leaking roof. Uh, it's very good for picking up uh, leaks, but not very good for telling you where it's actually leaking, but only that you've got a leaking roof. Because water, there's an old saying, will find its own level. Basically, it sorts out where it wants to go. Mm. And it's often where it appears, not where it started from. Uh, but you get tracked. You can do track, but then you've got to be able to get into the ceiling space. So you're going to be able to see it. And um, that can be tricky. can be done, but it's tricky. Um, air leaks, we've already seen. Checking insulation, I've got a... Um, image on here showing that, uh, performing energy audits I mentioned before. Generally looking at construction defects, you can pick up some of them, um, especially where you haven't got the things tied together where they should be. Um, you'd be expecting a, 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 a thermal bridge and when it's not there, it says, well, hey, it's not tied in. Um, or, uh, you know, well, things like the air leaks are often a, a defect in the sense that things haven't been finished off properly. A lot of sort of basic things can be checked with this. Um, so what you said before about the drafts, it's probably good to do on a, in, if you're doing it in winter, with a, on a windy day. Yeah, and, well, so and, and the point is, if, that's right, the point is you usually can only do one part of the building. Yeah. Um, and this is something you have to understand mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, and look, that sort of stuff is very good uh, for yourself, but you do actually have to ask, if you're trying to do it commercially, whether it's still going to be worth trying to fix all those leaks. You've gone around and found them all, but how much energy is being lost? What's the, uh, mm. the payback? And quite often we can find a lot of things here, but the payback's really not there. Um, but it's not so much the camera that's the problem, but just the cost of making the repairs. Mm. But, and that's why, these things, for it. that's why these things should be done really before you hand over a building. During, mm. during construction. During construction and you know, before the final handover is when they should be done, but they're not getting done. The commissioning, they're just not getting done there. Mm. Um, moisture in roofs, which is basically um, generally moisture intrusion generally, but roofs can be a problem in themselves. Uh, and this in particular applies to um, flat roofs um, where you have the bitumen type coating on the top, which is very common in some commercial buildings and more generally in the US in particular, but they also use it a lot in Europe. We don't use it a lot out here. You see a lot of the grand design changes go, it just looks like a, a disaster waiting to happen, doesn't it? But, yep. <laughs> yep. But they well, continue yeah, to well, they continue to do it. They, they, they do worry me too. Um, but, well, that's up to the builders, they love their flat roofs. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of these commercial buildings in the US over large areas, um, they will do surveys on the roof itself. They're not very successful out here usually because we have got a different construction. This again is where you've got to know the technology you're dealing with. You've got to understand that the way you construct the building, what does that mean, mean for how I can use the camera. But it's used quite widely there. Electrical inspections, I'll put it under building applications because you know we mentioned things like the PowerPoint there. You can pick up these types of pulses which are going on around the place. And it's not unusual for people are doing a sort of an energy audit or some other checking on the building to suddenly pick up electrical pulses. Uh, you're not going around deliberately looking for it, but sometimes they just stand out. Uh, if you see a light switch or something glowing pretty hot, then, yeah, the chances are there's, there's something current going, there's something going on. And, um, and you should, you've got a duty of care basically, you should be reporting that if you've seen something. You don't have to tell them what it is wrong, unless you've got electrical background and you feel that you can come do that, but you should say, well, that should be checked mm -hmm. at least. And the other one is termite inspections. Mm. It's It was an area which was getting a lot of use at one stage using the cameras. It seems to have dropped off a little bit. Um, and I think it's partly because people make excessive claims. Mm. You're not going to be able to pick up individual termites with the cameras. Um, you're not likely to even be able to pick up a track of them where they're marching along. But you will be able to find the nest. And more often, what you're finding actually is where they have had activity, what they tend to call as muck, where they leave it behind. This is actually often ends up being a cold spot. Okay. And so if you 
find a lump type area, I'm not going to do it here because this is all um, concrete, but in normal wood framed houses with the, the uh, plasterboard, um, drywall, if you start typical places above door frames, you see sort of a mass like that sitting there, strange shape, the chances are it's where you've had termite activity. Um, you see it around window frames and so on. So again, if you understand something about the behaviour of the termites, then you can start interpreting that. If you don't understand what they do and how they operate, then you're not going to get the right result. I've had people who've claimed to have seen or will be able to show you the track of a termite in a wall, and what they were actually looking at was a hot water pipe. <laughs> got to know. So this is the problem is people go around saying these things. So within buildings, it's a big range of things. Now I can't go into detail to have all of those at the time, but I'm just making you aware of one of the briefs was to let you know what can be done and what you're looking for. So, so it also be commonly air leaks and insulation performance. Uh, and moisture. Moisture is a, a very big yeah. one. So this is a case of where we have um, moisture, which is actually sitting under the tiles here in this um, toilet. Um, and um, obviously you can see some sort of water stain there perhaps. Um, but it's not really obvious that there's any major leak. Uh, leakage uh, or moisture, but we're picking it up here. Now, in this case where you've got the tiles, we were talking before about evaporation. It's probably not evaporation in this case, because vinyl tiles tend to be fairly impervious to the water. What's happened is the water's got down between the tiles and it's underneath, and we now have to look at different properties of water. Water has a high thermal mass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if this room was fairly cool to start with and then we started to heat it up, the area of moisture will heat up more slowly. So again, you've got to understand what you're looking at. Um, and this is some of the things you do sometimes. If you just go into a building, you can't sometimes see anything because it's all pretty much stabilised over time. So if you get on a rising temperature... So you look at a rising or falling. falling. So this is where you sometimes will crank up the AC, um, either heating or cooling, to change the conditions. And then you're observing it. And you'll need to give a little bit of time for things to warm up, but not too long. Other times you can make use of the sun doing the heating. Like at sundown or something when it starts to drop off. Drop off and you'll start to see. Now you have to be careful with the sun, but it can be a, you can make use of it. I had to do a job, or have to, I did a job a few years ago, um, quite a few years ago now, um, for a commercial building in Sydney where they had um, concrete cancer. So basically you have um, moisture getting in behind the concrete facade. Um, into the um, Rio behind, and as the um, Rio starts to uh, to rust, the uh, corrode the, the corrosion products expand and push off the concrete. And they're having lumps of concrete falling from the tops of the buildings. And this is a very tall building down in well, I think it's Martin Place or somewhere somewhere central anyway. <laughs> And um, they didn't really, they weren't really happy about that. Yeah. So they really wanted to know what the extent of the amount of uh, moisture, you know, how many areas were affected. The multi was able to help to some extent, but I could only do it essentially on the east, north, and west faces. I did not do anything on the south face where I had no heating. Mm. And then I had to do it at the right times of day for each part of it. Mm. Uh, and so you really need to know what you're doing. That really took a bit of effort to do. Um, but this is where this is where the experience comes in. Uh, okay. This is a case of um, a carpet with um, where they've um, been um, supposedly uh, dry cleaned almost. You know, one of these steam cleaners which is supposed to leave it completely dry, and um, having done it uh, a little bit later say two hours after the cleaning, they were still able to pick up these areas here. In this case, it is the evaporation that's cooled, that's cooled it down. One morning, I, I went into my office at work, and there's a strange smell, a really strange smell. It actually smelled a bit like some animal had urinated in the room. Mm. It wasn't very pleasant. I wonder what was going on got out my infrared camera and I could see these wet patches all over the place 
that obviously had the cleaners in cleaning it, and they've got some funny chemical in there to supposedly make it all clean, but it was just a horrible smell. And that was still there for several hours after. It took a while, but it should not have been like that. But I was able to monitor that. Um, so, you know, things like that hasn't been done properly. If you've had water damage coming into a building, has all the water been actually dried out? Well, the not way of selling, as well as using moisture meter. But this is a quick overview. I don't have to go and touch every spot on moisture meter. Um, this, in fact, is my office. Uh, where I deliberately um, dropped a bit of water onto the uh, carpet somewhere. Somewhere around there there's some water. Um, it was dropped on there about three hours beforehand. I actually had a um, little tangential heater um, heating it for an hour and a half. So it should have been dry. And very clearly there was still a very clear wet patch. Very handfully dry. That's how effective technology is for those types of applications. And I mean, in this case I knew what it was because I deliberately put the water there. But um, even if you didn't, um, you have to start looking at the floor and saying, well, why would it be cold other than that? That might be some other reason. There might have been a huge draft coming in from somewhere blowing on there. It could happen, so you need to look at your AC ducts and so on, but that wasn't the case. Um, leaking roofs, this is um, from the, taken from the U, or it might be from, um, from Sweden or somewhere actually. Um, but again, flat roof, this one's with a bitumen type layer, which the like, water gets under it. Mm. It doesn't actually go through into the building yet, but it gets under there and cuts, and so the insulation not nearly as effective. Mm. And um, look for leaks. In this case, it's showing up as hot, not cold. The reason? Mm. We're using the thermal mass. This has been done at night, and the rest of the roof on. has cooled down more quickly than where the water is. Had the sun on. So it had the sun earlier, well the whole roof did, the whole lot came up to temperature. If I'd been there at 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I would have seen nothing, mm. because it's all heated. Mm. But going there at, um, in the evening, after the sun's gone down, and I've given the roof time to start cooling down, I can get that contrast. This could well have been around about midnight to two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes that gives us best contrast. Mm. Which then leads to all sorts of safety issues because you're up on these roofs <laughs> in basically pitch darkness and you're wandering around with an infrared camera and um, you're looking at the image on the infrared camera and you've missed the edge. And, well, actually you don't miss it, you fight it. <laughs> uh, so there's actually guidelines for doing this type of stuff. And in this country, of course, we would normally say you have to have two people, mm. um, one for solder. But uh, a lot of individual private contractors don't. And in the US, they don't always have those rules anyway. I'm not sure about Europe, but I know in the US there's major issues with going on the roofs. Uh, this is a case of um, just a, a, a manhole, or maybe even just uh, bleeding up into an attic uh, door, and you can see the very strongly the leaks around it. It's not really surprising around uh, attic doors, uh, or leading up into the attic, um, but uh, you stand up very clearly. This, by the way, is a light, and it's showing up as grey because it's so hot that it's beyond what we're actually able to measure. It shows up some quick difference. That's a, not all the cameras have that. Your camera might do it that way, I don't think. So, um, what, what time of day would be best to check around the manhole? Well, this one, it, because this is looking at the air leakage, it's really uh, when you're getting um, air flowing, so you need to have it so that where the wind would be blowing, so that it's actually coming basically under the tiles or somewhere else and getting into the roof space and then being able to spread out. So time of day is not so important. Um, uh, the only real exception there would be if the air itself is about the same temperature as the room, you won't pick it up. So you're looking for where there's a difference in temperature. So maybe the evening's better because it's cooler than the rest of the day, but... So if inside the house was really hot, you probably wouldn't see that because of the heat. Oh no, if, it's, if the inside of the house was hot, and this was a cold day outside, and the air was blowing, you'd still pick it up. So this is why you can do it in the middle of the day if you've got a heated house. It's where you don't heat the house and you're getting everything about equal. If it's a mild day, it's going to be terrible. But middle of winter, middle of summer, where your house is being brought to a temperature 
which is comfortable for us, which is different to our side, you'll pick that up. But you must have the air flowing, flowing through there. Often in these cases, you can actually feel it anyway, you know what's going on. But in some cases, you're not clear where the leaks are. People will sit in a room and say, I'm feeling cold. All the sort of normal measurements will show that it's okay in the room, but they're actually getting drafts. And then where is it coming from? The infrared camera is a good way of picking that up. If they're saying they're feeling cold, then it's got to be coming in somewhere. From the doors, around windows. windows. There'll be lots of places, but the camera will show where, it's, where the problem is for these people. Um, energy losses. This is, um, besides the losses through the windows themselves, this is uh, typical cases of where, um, when they're building houses, they have difficulty insulating under the windows, and so they tend to leave it out. They shouldn't put the effort not always done. Um, and it's not unusual to see these images. It's not how it should be, but it's what happens. Mm -hmm. So what we're picking up there is clearly, this is where you've got a cold outside, heated inside, and you're getting the energy lost through there. You know we're going to get it through the windows. Not something you necessarily want, but we know you're going to get it. Um, putting drapes across and so on would help that. It may make a big difference. You see where the blinds are. Yeah. And you can see it makes a big difference. Uh, so, how we go? We might just have time for case study in the time I've said, and then we'll be on to uh, Q&A or anything else we want to see. So, I did a case a couple of years ago now of an older house in uh, North Melbourne, and they had an extension put on it which had a flat roof, for people. Um, but they, it was just the nature of the extension, and they, actually this flat roof was also acting as a patio on top. So besides a normal flat roof, they then had tiles on it, ceramic tiles. The ceramic tiles meant that it was not going to be possible to do the survey from on top. I could not check for leaks on top like we were looking at the one with the bitumen before. The ceramic tiles just make that almost impossible for this application. Mm. Can for some cases, like that bathroom one, where I know it's the final tiles, mm. but, but, but you have a problem with normalising you really got to be finding it in all the gaps. It becomes a real headache. Mm. Um, sometimes you can be lucky, but it's not the easiest way. Mm. Now, the owner felt that they had that the roof was leaking. I'm not quite sure why, um, but they were pretty sure that they had leaks. Now, whether they could smell it, whether there was something strange going on, um, that they just felt there was. But they wanted some evidence. How do you prove it to the builder? that they've got to fix it. Um, the roof itself had basically a wood construction in terms of the frame, waterproof <coughs> membrane, and then, as I said, clad with these ceramic floor tiles. Um, so inside the house, um, underneath where this uh, patio was, we had in a number of rooms, so this was um, a uh, re-entrant part like around here, but you've got the um, cornice going around there, and that's what you've got there, but it's an external one, not an internal as on here, but an external like that. Um, and we had this clearly cool spot there. Around this light fitting, we had a um, very significant uh, cool area. We also had this strange looking pattern here, but that was moisture as well. And we had another lot there. So we had moisture in lots of places in the roof. And I was quite certain that they were a problem. Is that the moisture meter there though? No, that's just someone's pencil. Oh, yeah. Just because so what we did was, what, what I did, this is before I had a moisture meter. Um, this is going back a few years, so I now have one. Brought it with me. Um, but in order to sort of just mark out where it was. Yeah. So uh, we could go back after and then say, well, that's where we think it is. Mm. Um, now, we showed this, so I, I was quite certain that that's what we had number of damp areas. I, I really had no doubt in my mind that that's what it was. Uh, a number of reasons. Partly because of just the irregular shape. That's typical of what you get of dampness. If you have nice sharp lines, it's probably not dampness. It's something else. Water doesn't sort of just stop at nice clean boundaries. It tends to do this dissipation. Uh, the builder architect really wasn't that convinced about it. So I said to the owner, because so we looked around, whilst it's not clear here, this one looked by far the worst. I said, 
drill a very small hole in your ceiling. And next time it rains, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to have water dripping through. And the builder will have to And sure enough, that's what happened. And the builder then started saying, ah, oh, baby, this is happening in this technology. <laughs> Uh, now these cameras were a bit more expensive then, they're still, you know, you're talking before about the big one, mm. it's like Eric's big one there. Yeah, um, they were um, about 60000 at the time for a new one, um, and so you can't expect everybody to buy them. Mm. Certainly the architects probably could have bought it, even if the builders themselves could. Mm. Um, but anyway, they had the, they, they went out... They had a vested interest, they, they were looking to not do anything about not course. to find anything. That's right. <laughs> but the point was that they can, they can start improving things mm. themselves as well. Um, so they thought they fixed it. And I had to go back again and again and again, I think it was. I think I went back four times in total. Um, in the end, they actually basically had to rip up all of the ceramic tiles and relay the membrane. Mm. Um, and one of the problems was, there's multiple areas, does that mean we have multiple leaks or is it just the way the water drips in and then decide to run all over the place down the bearers inside? Mm -hmm. The ceiling space was fairly tight. We could sort of just see in there, but you couldn't really see enough to work out where it was coming from. And that was part of the problem as well. Um, as I said, this is one of the problems with water. And it's one of the things about the cameras. I won't necessarily tell you exactly where the source is, but you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reason I'm not wealthy is because I got paid in scotch for that job. <laughs> Every time I went out, I got another bottle of um, Shiver's Reef. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, could have asked for something better, but I could have sold one. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Mm. Um, and I was, it was interesting. I seemed to just about get through the bottle when I'd get called out. Because they did. You weren't there with a the hose, were you? <laughs> <laughs> could the water have been on the other side of the membrane? Or would you have still picked it up if it no. was? No. It, it, this was clearly in the ceiling. There was a gap in the ceiling. There was, a, the, there was the, the, the roof itself, a small gap where you have the framework to the ceiling, and we were looking at the ceiling. I wonder if they had a plank there, some sort of sheeting to put the membrane on. Like, well, well, they would have had. They had a wooden. It was basically ply. I would have I mean, and, and that would have went damp as well, of course. But then it runs through that mm. onto the bearers and into yeah. onto the ceiling. Yeah. Um, I just point out here that one of the things is with these cameras and the software you have a number of different palettes, as they call them, different colours. So this is the same image, but just with different colours on them. And sometimes for, for reporting purposes, you may find that one of these other palettes works better. Here we've got a number of different colours, could get confusing. Here you basically say, well, everything is not red, is damp. Yeah. It's a bit easier sometimes. Mm. And so some of the palettes can be quite useful. And we talked before about, or I think Chris was mentioning, you've got um, Fleur tools available to you. And anybody can load it onto their computer. It's freeware. It's a pain, but they ask you to register and all the rest. But it's free, and you can tell them if you like. Um, but it allows you a big range of palettes, and you can start playing with it for sometimes actually even finding things that sometimes helps. Um, sometimes you go out with one and then come out with something else. Newer cameras will have quite often a visual with the infrared. This one has a visual with the infrared. Um, by the looks of it. It does. Uh, it does? Yeah. Good. So it looks like it does. So um, I, I take that to be the case. Um, and in which case it's probably got MSX on it. It has. Which allows you to um, basically overlay the um, the outline of the visual. Okay. I, so I so it's just the outline. Mm -hmm. so, with the, so the outline of the visual mm -hmm. goes onto That's the infrared. And that. it helps in sometimes in certain Here it's made clear. Yeah, but sometimes it's not so clear. Well, Eric, here we all Eric wants to come with a, a visual, a yeah. visual photo that he takes separately, yeah. and uh, well, that's because he doesn't have MSX. Yeah, that's right. On the old cameras, um, but also he will have a better image than you're probably getting off this one, and so he doesn't necessarily need it as much. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's one of the saviors for this, which has got a pretty basic detector, is the fact it's got the MSX. Suddenly you think you can see a lot more than you really can. <laughs> um, but it makes it nice. Mm. Um, not, if I've got the time, I'll plug that one in even perhaps and show you through the software. Um, but you do need to be careful. This case study, in another room, I found this up on the 
in the ceiling. And it looks strange. A bit too sharp. I mean, they're not completely regular shapes, but they're, they're a bit sharper than what we saw before. What is this? Is this a, a, why is it really stopping in between when it's so close? Especially the right one, because it looks like the stack's fallen over or something. Yeah, there's something <laughs> strange going on here. And so, the only way to tell is go use your eyes, go up there and look at what's going on. And what they had was, as it says there, the, some leftover ceramic tiles stacked were stacked up. And we're only talking about perhaps two or three tiles. But that extra insulation mm. was able to give us that image. So again, be very careful what you're looking at. Go and observe. Use what you've been given first before what you've bought. This side on the outside of the roof, were they? Sorry? The, the tiles were the tiles outside, outside on, top of the, on top of the roof. Mm -hmm. And this is inside. Um, there's in fact an area where, it, depending on how I took the image, it would actually look like someone's, we had a dead body up there or something. <laughs> um, but it wasn't that. It was partly just the way I took the image. So you have to be a bit careful. Not a very good story. Yeah. So, why do we want thermography? Despite all the problems that we can have, Basically, it's non-contact. That's a big plus for it. It gives us this two-dimensional image. We can see what we're looking at. That's very helpful rather than just getting single spots. And it's also relatively fast. You're not having to process and wait for a long time. You can see it when you're there. And that's about it. So mm, thank you, very good. ladies and gentlemen. And any questions or more questions? There are some animals that do see into some of the infrared, probably not as far as these cameras go. But we do know there's some animals that do. In fact, most animals actually have, well, a lot of animals actually have an extended range on us. I've found bats in the ceiling. With bats in there. Bats, thing. yeah, yeah. But that's not what the question here was, is yeah. whether animals actually have this. I've got, hundreds of, I've got hundreds of bats in my ceiling. Yeah, you can <laughs> pick them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, fiberglass bats. Yes. Please don't think just because complete spectrum. Insects seal the ultraviolet. Okay. So, yes, there's certainly any questions. Yeah, yeah, here we go. I've also got that, which is a, an image which was taken with a camera which had um, visual and the infrared, so like yours. That's an overlay one. And this is where they've had what we've called fusion, but I could show it as an MSX if I wanted to. And one of the things is your camera does not have on it fusion or what they call picture in picture, but because it's got the MSX, if you run it through here, you then can have an image like this. It's one of the nice things about this software. So you suddenly get more features than what you pay for, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, is that the software that came with the camera? You're That's the Fleur Tools. Fleur Tools. This is the basic Fleur Tools. There is a paid version called Fleur Tools Plus, but um, I find the Fleur Tools is fine for most purposes and uh, how you use it varies. This one I like simply because I've tuned it to show, unfortunately it's all the red areas, but I've tuned it in such a way that only where I've got thermal was it actually looking cooler than everything else. Mm. Um, and whether it meant we had missing, missing insulation in the ceiling, we may have, but certainly in the wall that was uh, put down to missing insulation. Not one I took, but someone else has taken. So I've got a whole lot of those as well. Well, with this spray, I was a lot of the WD before it's been quite um, Well, that's a good question there. Well, it's actually pretty colder, actually. As I said, it's one of the things about the artifact here. Remember, that all the rest is visible, yeah. and all we're looking at is there. That's the only place it's picking up, and it's actually not operating on that. It's actually operating on a reduced one. Yeah. Um, this is colder than everything else. If I take, go out of that and just look at the, um, the, the infrared, um, where are we? Thermal blending, uh, thermal, just look at the thermal. Mm. First of all, it's much more difficult to see anything. Mm. It's not nearly such a nice image. Um, this is what happens when you have cheaper cameras. Um, something like Eric's camera or even my one, I would expect to see a better looking image than that. But coming out of Yours, that's quite likely what you'd see. Yeah, yeah. But with the MSX and that fusion, suddenly it 
it changes the whole that you're looking at. But there you can see where we had the WD the red bit. What was it? Oh, I think um, red's bottom right. Still that one there, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what I'd normally expect the cold if you've recently squirted it. What's the is it cold do you reckon is it or yeah, um, well that's what it appears to be, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. What I can do is I can put the MSX on. Uh, it's but isn't it warm? It warmers up the top, isn't it? In warmers at the top of that scale there, yeah. So it is warmer. It is warmer, yeah. Well, well that's probably because the emissivity of the plastic versus Well, this, is, this could be an emissivity problem quite likely. Um, I'm not sure. We'll have to go back and look at the... What have I got there? That's the MSX. So, that's what you'll get with your MSX there. So we just leave all thermal and just get this outline. Mm. Some of you think, oh, hey, I can see a lot more. But it's, it is somewhat misleading. It does not mean you've got better thermal resolution now, or spatial resolution of the thermal. It's just I can now identify where it is. Yeah, how would this go for, say, um, roof extraction, you know, roof extraction fans? Uh, what would what, what, what make the motor work better? <laughs> You're saying something like that, but it was working. Well, Say like, you know, there's one that's hot day, roof heats up, you want to get the area. Yeah, and and you're wanting the camera, well, what you're trying to tell? Well, how hot it is up there or something? Yes, I suppose before and after, you know, how would you monitor it, you know, that's the... I think these cameras would be fine for, for that. that yeah. Look, anything where you can use a spot one, you can use this. Mm. But you mm. can't use a spot where all the places you can use this, because this is really um, many thousands of spots. Mm. Yes, yes. The, the, the only issue, issue is, if you like, is because we've seen before, we've got to depend on what's being radiated. So if you want an accurate number, it can be an issue. Whereas with a thermometer, you don't have that issue. It's basically taking on the same temperature. This is contact thermometers. It's taking on the temperature of the thing it's touching, not the radiation. That's what we talk about contact thermometers. If you're talking about what they sometimes call an infrared thermometer, which is really just a spot system, it's actually working the same as these. And, and actually they've got a problem. With gospel, and, and actually they're a real problem. Um, my uh, moisture meter has one built into it. And um, when I press it to get a number over here on the wall, you see it's got a, a nice um, laser stop spot and it's telling me that that's 24.7 or something. Now in this case it's probably about right because it's fairly uniform there but this has what they call an 8 to 1 uh, spot size ratio so whatever my distance from here to there is, what are we looking at? 5 metres? 5 metres? 5 metres? 6 metres? Um, so we're looking at um, Six metres divided by eight. You're looking at uh, what's that? Three quarters of a metre. Three quarters of a metre, so 750. Um, so what it's actually picking up is an average temperature of something about that size. <laughs> That's the trouble with these things. People think, oh, I'm picking up the spot, and you're not. That's where the infrared cameras, these ones at least, you can actually see what's going on. Peter, I think I owe you a, a, a thanks there. This means that my uh, spot gizmo, like that, mm. for which the spot has failed, is not as useless as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So the thing with those is to get close all the time. Is that well? That's what you need to do. Okay. Um, this one is actually quite bad. You can buy them where they are just the. Um, as they call them a. a, a um, an infrared thermometer, and it's a really misleading term, um, because first of all, I can't make adjustments that I can make on this one to allow for the different materials, different reflections, so it's going to be wrong anyway, but some of the ones you buy which are just the infrared thermometer, they at least often have a narrower beam than this one. Mm. This one to eight is dreadful. <laughs> some have two lasers, so you get an idea. Well, well some of them have a, a ring of them even yeah. trying oh, yeah. to give some idea. And they're not so bad, because at least you know what you're getting. Um, Can you do a plot of the emissivity? Talk, talk about emissivity in about two seconds? Well, not that far. Can't give you Ah! Two minutes? Okay, what can I do? 
Um, because I know it does get, get people into oh. some trouble with the, especially with the spotlight. Yeah, mm. well, I, I was going to. People tell you it was gospel and they're actually. Yep. Now we press that again, it comes alive, doesn't it? I think. That's what I've got to do. Press it twice. That's right. Why are you Press it once yep. more, I think. Um, I'm going to wait the camera to up too. I've already done it. Uh, yes, emissivity is a property of a surface which tells you how much energy it's going to emit compared with that of a perfect radiator, uh -huh. a surface which we perfect at doing it. What we normally find is that metals are very low emissivities. Poor. So they're poor emitters. They will give off very little of their radiation. Non-metals generally are better. Because it's based around a ratio, it's going to be a number between zero and one. Zero means that it's not emitting anything. One means it's doing the same as a perfect ideal radiator, which don't exist. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Surfaces like this carpet here, like the uh, seats here, would be probably of the order of about 0.93, so quite good emitters. Mm -hmm. Our skin, in fact, is probably the highest emissivity in this room at about 0.97. Okay, pretty good. So we're pretty good Most at emitting. Water. So we, we, we're fairly efficient at losing energy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we could overheat, basically. Um, so that aluminium, there'd be a shock hole around that, around, like, like that aluminium surround there would be quite poor around that. So, around the wake up camera. Now, you're not picking up much here what that aluminium is. It's looking much the same. And the simple reason is because nearly everything in this room is at the same temperature. Mm -hmm. It's only when you start getting a big contrast. Because mm -hmm. what happens is, um, but what I can quickly show, that's what I'm going to do, is um, have you got enough reach to look at the aluminium ducts, the air conditioning ducts up here? The lights. There we are. No, that's another light. Um, just trying to avoid that. There we go. Okay, so they've got coolness. In fact, I use it sometimes at work to tell what's happening with my AC from the ceilings because there's something wrong with the system we've got. Um, Sometimes it will be hotter in my duct coming out than it should be than anything else. It, it does weird things. It's, we've got this system which is throughout the whole building and it's supposed to have individual baffles on each of the registers, but they put one central section and it's a disaster. But what I wanted to do was to show the effect of emissivity. Now I should be able to do that. Come on, edit. There we go. Uh, I've been using a different camera recently, so it's really throwing me at the moment. Uh, so it's at the moment set at 0.95. And one of the problems with this camera and why I use a different camera on training is because this one hides everything. So let's just get out of this for the moment. So it's saying that spot temperature is 22.1. Okay? If I go and change that emissivity to something quite a bit lower, ah, I hate it. <laughs> I even prefer old ones where I can have buttons and things. Mm. Uh, in fact, I do have buttons on this one as well, which I can use, which is one of the nice things. Yours, you're stuck with just using the touch for everything. 
for nearly everything. This one I can play with it. In fact, as I'm doing that, just doing it. Mm -hmm. you're seeing it's making some difference. Not a lot in this case. Mm -hmm. And the main reason it's not making much difference here is because the reflected temperature is about the same as the object itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. If we changed also, so leave it like that, and we now go to there and change the reflected temperature, and made that something quite different. What does the reflected temperature mean in this case? So, I've now got this a reading of minus 13 degrees, just by changing parameters. Now, what's the reflected temperature mean? <coughs> okay, can I do this in 20 minutes, 20 seconds as well? <laughs> It's first of all, what we're talking about is what is reflecting off that. What is the temperature of the thing that's reflecting off that? Right. Now that's putting it very simply, mm -hmm. because what's reflecting is in fact radiation. So if we say what's up there is actually, look at the angle, it's probably the desk over here or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not just what this emits, but remember this desk also is reflecting some. So it's a combination of what it's emitting and what it's reflecting. This is what we call an apparent temperature. Mm. I can't actually get that number, the reflected number, from putting a thermometer on that desk. Yeah. There is a way of getting it, but you basically use the camera for it. A couple of different you, set, no, you just set the emissivity to one mm. and uh -huh. look at that, and it gives you what total energy coming from that. It doesn't give you the actual temperature, it gives you the total energy. You use that figure. So we can do it, but uh, that's where it comes from. But you can see that when I combine a low emissivity with the, uh, well, a moderate emissivity, lowish of 0.5 something, with this low temperature, I can't remember what it was now I had in there, but it's a high temperature. So I had a reflected temperature of 51 degrees. I had a um, emissivity of 0.53. Those two together, make a huge difference. If I go back and change my emissivity back to... Um, Can you give some examples from four low, very low emissivity? Well, as I said, good reflectors. This will be quite low, but the reason we're not seeing much effect is, is because it's pretty much the same as everything else. Yeah. With the reflected being at about 20 degrees in the room, and this is being about 20 degrees, it's a bit hotter than that, 22 degrees yeah. or so, you're, right. you're not going to pick up much. Yeah. But if I was looking at something that definite contrast you'll start to see. What you will see is if I'm standing or someone's standing there and I'm looking at an angle where you're reflecting in it, oh. then you'll start seeing a huge difference. Because what happens is if you've got low emissivity, you've got high reflectivity. reflectivity. Mm. The two together make you up all the erroneous stuff coming in. So that's where it becomes the balance. Mm. Mm. And you don't need much reflected to show up. You know, I showed that one of the window. Mm. The window glass has an emissivity of about 0.85, 85%. Mm. So it's reflecting only 15%. And yet I showed up very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't need much in the way of reflection to do that. But once we get this up to the order of um, the 0.95 again, We've now got, it's not quite the same, we had about 22 degrees or something before, mm -hmm. but this is now about the same. You're not yeah. too far out. Yeah. Even though we've got a ridiculous reflected. Yeah. So reflected becomes very important when you're looking at low emissivity objects. Mm. You can get by with being somewhere in the ballpark when you're looking at high emissivity objects. You still wouldn't want to put in a long way out, but no one's going to put 51 degrees in, I would hope. What's water like? Water is Water's, well, good for water has got um, water when you're looking at it um, straight on up to about 45 degrees has a high emissivity. emissivity yeah. It's of the order of about 0.96, perhaps 9.4. I'm trying to remember now, but pretty good. Water itself is pretty good. <sighs> trying to remember ice. I think it's also very good, but snow is bad from memory. I think that's right. 
might be the way around. Like it had a stone and stuff like that. The stone yeah. itself is a non-metal and tends to have a high emissivity. No problem. Uh, even if it's a polished stone, it is still quite high. Um, we don't have one here, but a ceramic cup. Bloody ceramic cup. Nice mm -hmm. and bright, you think nice and shiny. It's got an emissivity of about 0.85 to 0.9, depending, really on, to, depending on what it is. It's certainly not down where the metals are. Mm -hmm. This here, at a guess, would be probably, given the surface treatment on it, um, and that's, I don't think it's paint, I think it's actually a surface treatment on it. Like anodizing. As I said, anodizing, which is probably raised as quite a lot. This could be as high as 0.5. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, yeah, it's like machine steel, flat steel. Yeah, the tripod legs there. Mm -hmm. I would be expecting them to be of the order of probably about 0.15. Okay. So uh, raw very aluminium. low. Very low. Raw aluminium basically. Okay. So there's no, there's really no correlation between emissivity and density at all. No. No, not no density no. whatsoever. No. No. It, it, it really is a, um, it's an electrical property amongst other things. It yeah. is because light and infrared is part of that spectrum as we saw before, is what is officially known as electromagnetic radiation. It's the actual electrical charge which interacts with the surface. So it's also related to whether it's gloss or a matte sort of finish and a rough finish? It makes very little difference. Does it? You all and smooth, or rough, smooth or rough, same? I mean, rougher, rougher surfaces yeah. will have higher emissivities. But it makes almost no difference when you're looking at stone and so on because they're already high. Mm -hmm. It makes a big difference to metals. Yeah. Um, if you've got metals which are corroded, they have much higher emissivities. One of the problems, I can call it a problem, yeah, I think it's a problem, with these cameras, and um, it's not just FLIR, it's all of them. Um, if I look at that there, they have an emissivity table you can look up. Mm -hmm. That's going to help me, isn't it? Oh yes, most definitely. Okay, we look at aluminium. First of all, they haven't got um, our smooth aluminium, but they have got a clean, and they're saying down at 0.07, so even lower than what I was guessing there. But they're calling it rough. Mm. Weathered, they're saying 0.83. Wow, that's a huge range. <laughs> so when I look at my piece of aluminium, where do I put the number? <laughs> Somewhere in between. What do I choose? Yeah, yeah. I hate these tables because they really don't help much. much. <laughs> they help us. So they're, they're, they're not too bad for building purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Bricks and so on. Well, 0.81, it may not be 0.81. It could be 0.82. It could be 0.85. It could be 0.78. But they're all fairly high to start with. It's still important to get the reflected right. But or roughly right, but it's nothing like having to deal with aluminium or steel or copper. So all the electrical people, if they're really worried about temperatures, yeah. are going to have an issue. Now, the thing to note here is that, I'll get out of that so I don't, otherwise I'll forget what I'm using. Um, you didn't leave that. When you come to electrical, and I've probably still got on 51 degrees, haven't I? Um, That'll really throw me later. Um, reflect the temperature, yes. Uh, um, when it. Can you check? I was, I was reading if you do put a piece of crumpled alfoil and measure the reflectivity from that, can you then use that as an approximate for, for your emissivity? Yeah, not for emissivity. No, no, it's it's got to equal one. It, you use it for your reflect. No, it doesn't give you the reflectance. Mm -hmm. What that crumpled aluminium does is it helps you find what the reflected temperature is that you should put in the camera for the reflected yeah. temperature. Not the emissivity number, but that reflected number. Yeah. And that's quite different. It's a reflected okay, yeah. temperature. Once it's and, and it's basically what you do with that is if you're not quite sure where the sources of the reflections are, you take this crumpled piece of aluminium uh, foil and then flatten it out again as well yeah. as you can. So you've just got an uneven surface. But because the aluminium foil on the bright side is a very high emissivity, you sorry, very low emissivity, yeah. very high reflectance, you assume that in fact there is no emissivity okay. 
and, it's, and you basically do the same thing as if I was looking directly at the object. Yeah. Yeah. So I either look at the source of the reflection or at the thing I want. To, uh, if I want to get the reflection up, what's reflecting off there, I could get on some steps to try and put my visible aluminium up there mm. and then shoot at that and see what you get. But it's not always convenient. If I'm doing electrical Jeez, work with electrical cabinets, I'm not going to take a sheet of aluminium foil on a live cabinet yeah, really. and put it against there. I might get my apprentice to do it, but I'm not going to be doing it. Um, yeah, you keep your apprentice moving through. <laughs> so, you know, it's not always convenient to do that. Mm. I usually... It's good with buildings, though. Oh, it can be very useful. I've used it. Um, I haven't done it here, but my, certainly my older camera, I used to always keep a piece in the, in the box. I've got so much other rubbish in this box these days that I don't do that. But if I was going out on a job, that's what I would have with me. Whether I need it on the map or not, I'd have it with me just in case. Mm. Peter? I've got a question followed by an observation. The question is, if one is in a room, and this is probably a quite a good one, and one lined up a whole lot of materials and left them for 24 hours at all the same temperature, and you then shot this, take a look at them with this camera, that is going to give you assuming a fairly good um, assessment of the different emissivity of the different material. Oh, they made the same. <laughs> that was with you, Peter. But will they read the wrong temperature <laughs> somewhere else? Oh, they'll all read the right temperature. Well, it depends on what inputs I'll put in. Yeah. <laughs> if I put the wrong inputs in, I'll get the wrong temperatures. Well, I mean, if you left it on 0.95 and you have but, them, but, but, one but if I left it on 0.95 and I have the correct reflected, then it's not going to make any difference. The only way that will work is if I have a reflection in them which is different to the room. But if it's the room reflecting off them, then it's the two added together are going to, doesn't matter what I put, it's my fractions. Mm. Put it very crudely, and this is not the correct <laughs> mathematics, <laughs> please. This is not correct mathematics, but it's the easy way to think about it. Oops. The energy that the camera receives as I said, this is lying, so don't anybody plump it to this and put my name to it. Mm -hmm. uh, is made up out of the emissivity by the temperature of the object plus the reflectivity. Or should, if I'm using Greek, I suppose I should stay with the Greek. <laughs> by the temperature that's reflected. That's putting it very crudely. It's actually not quite correct, but it's got the right idea. Mm -hmm. Now, we've already said that, or well, I've already said, that the reflected plus the emissivity adds up to one. Oh, yeah. It's either reflecting or it's emitting. Mm -hmm. Now that is true. So I can replace that with one minus the emissivity. And that is in fact what your cameras do. When you put the emissivity in, they have to know what the reflectance is, and they, that's what they do. They do that calculation. Mm. Okay. So that's the first bit. Now, if we're in a room where you've left all these samples to get to the temperature of the room, because you've left them 24 hours, and the room itself is at the same temperature as the object because they're all in this room, so this is the same thing as object, It's not going to matter what my emissivity is for my different samples. The total is still going to be the same. They're all going to look the same. Yeah. Only if I could then Shoot walk the in down. with a hot mug of water or something and then have this as something different and reflect off each of them. But if it's simply the room reflecting off them, I'm not going to see a thing. So if you and that's why when I was looking at this, we visibly can see a lot of difference here. But the infrared camera's not picking up. Not because I've got a bad infrared camera. It's simply because everything here is about the same temperature as the room, and the room's reflecting off it. The observation I'm going to come to is now perhaps a null, is that the inside of a big building like this is probably not a very good place to demonstrate <laughs> the thermal imaging camera. You're, you're better off going to the outside wall where you've got the leakage coming through and the mm -hmm. hot sun outside. Certainly an internal 
room like this becomes quite problematic. But it's not impossible if you are able to control the environment. So that if I'm looking for insulation breakdown between the rooms, leakage and so on, and we're able to either air condition this space separate to what's outside, make it much hotter, make it much colder than what's outside, then I may be able to do something. Now, partly a matter of can I get to these walls from the other side, because when I'm air conditioning here, I'm probably pressurising it here, so there's going to get leakage going out. Mm. You can see it down the doors and everything. So if I want leakage. But if I assume it's just one insulation breakdown or missing, so long as I make this a lot colder or a lot hotter than outside, I will still see it. I don't, need, the leak. I don't need to have the air flow. So heat flowing in will flow to the well, That's right, it'll flow in anyway because it's the temperature difference that drives that, not the air. That's where you made it, yeah. So if we all suddenly crank this down and start freezing yeah, it's four, it's and the air around comes along, we can start to see it. Now, is four or five degrees enough or something like that, or you need more? The recommendation is that you need to have at least, at least 10 degrees C difference. Ooh. And ideally you'd be looking for about 20 degrees difference. Then you can really start picking things up. Um, Gee, so a frosty morning is zero and it's 20 inside. Inside, then you're okay. This is why northern hemisphere, northern parts of the US, northern parts of Europe, oh. they love it for winter surveys because they are down to minus 10, yeah. <coughs> minus yeah, 15, 18, and then 18, 20. In fact, more. In those places, they seem to overheat them. Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual to be more like about 24 in them. And so you get this wonderful contrast. Mm -hmm. We have it actually much more difficult in this country, generally. But if you have a really hot day, a 40 degree day, and we do get them sometimes in Melbourne, um, and you've got your house down to 20 degrees, you're still a very good contrast. Mm -hmm. But 10 should do it for new cameras. Mm -hmm. Should be able to pick it up at 10 degrees. But five, <laughs> you're probably struggling. Yeah. Well, honestly, you can't. Yeah, but, but, but you're going to start getting these noisy looking images instead mm -hmm. of nice, really crisp. And then it really does make a difference which camera you've got, Chris. Uh, with the um, the metal problem, I've yep. heard one solution is to put masking tape on the metal, and after it's settled down, you take a um, reading of the masking tape. Yep. Oh, to get the actual temperature. To get the temperature. Mm. Because what we find, well, not so much masking tape, although you can use that, and that's fine. What we normally talk about, and again, I usually carry, but I don't, or used to carry, I don't do it enough these days, is the um, insulation tape, the vinyl, the oh, PVC yeah. insulation tape, tape, the electrical, okay. tape, not yeah. duct tape, the electrical yeah. insulation tape. Yeah. You're saying the duct, the silver duct uh, tape. Well, silver so duct tape is a bit different, but it's... No, not we've, silverized, we've, the plastic yeah, but, yeah, PVC. But, but we've, um, talking about Eric, mm. he once took uh, a piece of masking tape, a piece of packing tape, mm -hmm. the electrical tape, a bit of um, gaffer tape, tape yeah. and when he imaged it with his camera, it was actually out with this was put onto something like a mug or something which is hot mm -hmm. compared with the room. Mm -hmm. He was actually able to see the differences between them and normal cellophane, so yeah. a, a, a normal um, sticky tape. And, and, you, and it was emissivity differences, yeah. even though some of them you thought, well, they're all pretty plastic high. tapes, so they should be all the same, um, you are able to clearly pick it up. What we normally use is the electrical insulating PVC tape, mm -hmm. which you can get very cheap. Mm -hmm. And so normally I carry it with me. Um, and we normally assume that to have an emissivity of about 0.95. It probably actually doesn't. It's probably about 0.94, but <laughs> for most people, there's enough, there's enough other issues. Two people at the back there. I'm not sure who wants to go first. You, uh, one can fight over the other. In terms of, um, say, borrowing the ATA camera to have a look at our own house, are we better off doing that in the winter or in the summer to try and get... If we're only going to do it once, yeah, depends on what you're looking for. Well, in terms of leaks, anyway. Frosty morning sounds good with either. Well, <laughs> well, well, if you're looking for leaks, you've really got to have it on a windy day, right. most likely, or you're able to get outside and run your aircon inside to blow it out, yeah. which can be difficult at times to actually pick up where the leaks are. Usually a lot easier finding leaks on the inside. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can do it outside, but it's usually easier. Um, so it's going to be windy and you can only look really from, on, as we were saying before, really the faces where the wind's blowing. So that becomes. So you've got to issue. pick a day when it's going to be a hot and orderly with a southerly change. <laughs> You'll get a couple of goes at it. Yeah. <laughs> I would. 
if you're looking for other things, um, then then I would think probably summer's better than winter um, because we have relatively mild winters here and we don't have a lot of heating of the building. I mean, if it's going to be a nice, bright, sunny day, even in the middle of winter, that could be of an advantage to you because the sun will heat up the building. But you really shouldn't be looking at it whilst it's heating it up. But again, wait for the sun to start going off and look at the differences. Oh, yeah. um, you do have problems and they, they talk about solar loading on buildings when you come to do buildings and they say that on masonry, the effect of the sun can remain there for up to eight hours in some cases. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're looking from the outside, you really have a big problem because what will happen is that the, you'll see areas which are looking hot and it could be not because you've got leaks from inside where you've heated the house the to the cold outside, it's because it actually heated up by the sun. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but, on the, but whereas on the inside, if you were allowing the house to be cold and just watching whether the heat's coming through, it may be you could get away with using that. So you have to think very carefully about it. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I would think probably summer works better than winter, okay. but it still needs to be quite a warm day. Mm -hmm. But you are looking, that's for the insulation, but if it's looking for leaks, then you're really just looking for the wind and being different to what the mm -hmm. house is. So a windy 20 degrees day is useless. Yeah. 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 But, um, although there is some cooling effect of the wind just over a surface anyway, but it's not enough. But either a hot windy day or a cold windy day will be a good day. Mm -hmm. You could probably um, try, and, try and get a good idea of, of heat, pure heat loss from a house, like insulation breakdowns or thermal bridging. Could you heat the house a little bit above where you normally would and then image it at like 6 or 5 o'clock in the morning before you had any influence from the sun? Yeah, well, yeah, well, this is the thing, but ideally you do it without the solar effect if you're able to get the con thermal contrast. Yeah. So it's a matter of can you get that thermal contrast. So we're talking, say, 2 or 3 degrees with 24 or 5 in the house, it's like a fair temperature yeah, in the house, you're like beginning to push it out, but yeah. you'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if your house has come down, so yeah, if we have a cool morning, well, cool overnight, so it hasn't been a hot day and the day before, so often you have to well, actually look at the history over a couple of days. and. You've had your AC, you're heating off. The house has now got down to five degrees or something. Oh, Everything's cool. about the same. And then we can then, and outside is about that. Now we turn the heating on. You can start looking for those differences. You've got it all nice and uniform to start with. You'll, you'll pick up those differences. Mm. And you do it either on the inside or the outside. Yeah. Um, low E glass. Normal glass, you said you get 0.85. Low E coatings, did they uh, tell you about uh, what do they change it to? Right. When they talk about low E glass, one of the things we've got to be understanding is what we're talking about is the emissivity over a bigger range than just what we're looking at with our camera. When we're talking about these emissivity figures, it's applying to that long the line. range that we're looking at, the 8 to 14 micron range. It varies, the emissivity varies according to the wavelength. <coughs> and a lot of that low E glass is low emissivities at the higher, right. sorry, at the shorter wavelengths. Where the, sun where, you get, where the sun has the maximum heating effect. So I can't answer what it does to that. Um, I've looked at some low E coatings um, paints and so on, and they did not seem to change the emissivity much at all in the range that we're looking at, for the cameras we're looking at. I've done tests on those, I've got a small specimen of one of those. So I, I'm sorry I can't answer that question. But, um, and this is again one of the problems of tables and things, you look up sometimes, you find wonderful tables. We saw those two numbers in that camera mm. of mine for aluminium. for aluminium. There are tables which will give you about six different conditions of aluminium. Mm. But some were done with wavelengths of our camera, some were done with wavelengths on the old camera, some were done with a whole range of wavelengths, in fact they basically say the whole lot. Some are taken looking straight down, some are looking at an angle, some were taken when the aluminium was at round room temperature, others at about 300 degrees C. So you can't always be sure what the numbers mean. And uh, so that's where we have a problem. So I'm sorry I can't answer that question for you with these cameras. I'm guessing like um, most electronic things, they'll just become 
better and cheaper as time goes on. Yeah, but they, don't, they can't change the physics. Mm. And the physics says I must put in the T reflected and the emissivity if I want a good temperature measurement. Mm. Doesn't matter how good that's, they are. That's $1,000. That was $10,000. Yeah. But the physics hasn't changed. Still going to put in a reflectivity. And this is the problem because when people spend ten thousand dollars on that, they might be prepared to pay two and a half thousand dollars to come to my course. Mm. When they spend a thousand dollars on that, they won't, and they start getting rubbish. Mm. And they'll start saying these things aren't any good. It's not this. What they're looking. At. It's the person using it. Now we might go and run slightly shorter, cheaper courses, but you've still got to take a couple of days to do it properly. Yeah. I thought it's just a point to wrap it up. Might move. Yeah. So there's no more questions. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting um, very talk. It's very thorough and cool. Um, we certainly learned a lot tonight. So, mm -hmm. Thank you very much.